Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! It's uh, six minutes after 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. I, I probably have told this story on the air before, but I want to tell it again for the sake of our guest. Um, years ago, decades ago, I worked uh, for the state of Florida. I worked for the juvenile detention center here in Ocala, and I worked the night shift. And there was a boy who told me that he was um, not feeling well, a teenager, maybe 16, 17 years old. He wasn't feeling well. So I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll come back now. I'm not a doctor, and we didn't have a nurse on duty overnight. When I came back to him, his tongue w- was swollen to the point where he couldn't talk anymore. And I said to, s- to my, my supervisor, I said, we, we have to call an ambulance or something. He's, he's really, really not good. His tongue is swollen. And basically she told me, no, nope, we're not going to do anything. He's, try- he's fooling you. He's trying to get out. He's, t- he's trying to trick you. We know mm-hmm. this kid. And... I said, no, 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 I, I saw it, his tongue is swollen, so I, I'm going to take him to the hospital, and she said, if you do, then you're not going to have a job when you come back, and I said, that's okay, Yeah. I don't want this guy to die uh, in, on my shift. Mm-mm. Well, I took him to the hospital, and if you want to know if I got fired, I did not. Um, however, um, what happened is, um, be- because he was um, incarcerated, and because I had taken it upon myself to be the one in control of the situation um i had no choice but to be there with him the entire time i had to stand there by the door by his well it was in that door it was a curtain okay Mm -hmm. so i drove him there uh, almost like an ambulance and and brought him in there and what i witnessed because it was it was nighttime it was the emergency room and i saw doctors and nurses running around people coming in unexpected people coming in by ambulances people coming in screaming crying bleeding it was like holy mackerel this is crazy how do these people live doing this job every day mm-hmm. how do they do this job every day and so i'm standing you know where this boy was and they eventually took care of his needs as well in fact they took care of him right away but but I had to be there. My the point is I had to be there, and I witnessed all of this. And when it finally settled down, I, I thought and they and they were able to let their hair down a little bit. And I could see the doctors and the nurses kind of just having small talk. I thought, whoa, I do so little in this world compared to what these people do. I have great respect for our medical professionals. And uh, Teresa Brown is on the phone. It says here she's a registered nurse. She works as a clinical nurse in Pennsylvania. She's a regular contributor to the New York Times opinion page and the American Journal of Nursing. She's the leading voice on health care as seen from the nurse's perspective. She's part of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's The Power of Narrative Project. She's a speaker on nursing, uh, end-of-life care, and health care in America. Wow, what a great contributor to us all. And she's written a book. Yes. It's called The Shift. One nurse... 12 hours, four patients' lives. I'm guessing when she heard me tell that story that she probably said, yep, seen that, done that, been there, done that. (laughs) I've seen all that. (laughs) Teresa Brown. Good morning, Teresa. Thank you for having me. How are you? I love you. I'm good, and I loved your story. It made me laugh. <laughs> oh, oh, good. That's my. That's the only thing I'm here on earth for is to get people to chuckle. I think. <laughs> so, where are you calling from? I am actually calling from. I live in Pittsburgh, but I'm calling from. Wisconsin, I'm at a retreat to try and talk about how to restore joy to caregivers in healthcare. Oh, I think Wisconsin is a good place because the way to get joy is to give them bratwurst, right, Robin? That's right, bratwurst yeah. and beer. Yeah, I think it's set. yeah, bratwurst and beer. That's how you, about Packers. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the message we get from Wisconsin. That's right. You nailed it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Our work is done. <laughs> 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 you know, and, and, and here's the kind of the irony of, of that, if, if the word irony is, is right or not, I'm not sure. But when the, 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 the firestorm that I was just trying to describe to you calmed down, it was things like food and music and, 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 and normal everyday things that the nurses and the doctors were all talking about. 
Yes, right. Well, you you need that, really. You need to be able to flip back to normal life and oh, feeling yeah. like an ordinary human being. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I remember they were talking about Jackson Brown's new album, so that's how long ago it was. Mm-hmm. Jackson Brown's <laughs> new album, yeah. Uh, well, Teresa, thank you for being on the air. So the, the shift, how's it going? How, when did the book come out? The book came out the end of September, but I um, am very happy to tell you that just yesterday I found out that I hit the New York Times bestseller list. For Good for you. Congratulations. Yeah. Good for you. This was my first public announcement. <laughs> so is, is, is the book about one, one shift, or did, was, it, was it a compilation of shifts that you've worked? It's, it's based on one real shift where I had two patients, and in the book I <clears throat> excuse me, named them Sheila and Mr. Hampton. Mm-hmm. Sheila came in, I thought she was fine, and she really, really, really wasn't. Mr. Hampton, I was quite worried about, and things turned out for him completely differently than I expected also. So that shift in that day really, really stuck with me as a nurse, and when I decided to write this book, I thought, oh, that is a story I have to tell. But the truth is, I remembered nothing else about that day except those two patients. I bet. Um, Wow. Well, it says four patients' lives here, so there were two others? Yeah, so I pulled in real patients from other shifts to create a sense of what would a real day uh, feel like, what things would come up, okay. you know, to uh, to try and give a really true flavor of what is a hospital shift yeah. like. Yeah, because Candace was almost like the comic relief, I think. Yes, yes. And I, I really wanted to put in there a, a patient who we define as a difficult patient so your uh, listeners will know she comes in she brings her own Clorox wipes she's not the only patient who's ever done that she's incredibly demanding um, and can be very difficult but she's also had some very very bad experiences on the healthcare system and so what I wanted to show is that usually patients like that they've really been burned and it's not that they're not dealing with it appropriately <laughs> you know always because <laughs> uh, they're quite difficult but there is a method to their madness um, and you know it just really gives the spectrum of you've got all of humanity you've got Candace and then at the very end of the day I get a new patient who's an African-American schizophrenic who's this incredibly mild-mannered guy who uh, you know, talks about uh, once I was I was talking to my V pump, but I'm no, I'm not supposed to do that. But the pump talked to me first, so that's oh. why I talked back. To oh, it. Man. <laughs> oh man! Oh <laughs> man! I, I just went to Amazon. So you have more than one book. You have a, a book called Critical Care, also. I do. Okay. Yeah. So that's a memoir of my first year of being a nurse. My background is I have a PhD in English. I taught English at Tufts. I had kids and I realized, wow, I don't want a job that's about books and people um, sitting at desks and reading. I want a job that's about mixing it up and being intimately involved in others' lives and helping them in a way that's really, really, really significant uh, physically you know, in terms of their health and well-being wow. so and, I, yeah and that's something that um you know family members have to adjust to because when you're working with other people you do get involved and then when you get home you might not be focusing on your own family right away yeah that that is hard and especially doing a 12-hour shift well 12-hour shifts are always 13-hour shifts anyway and when I get home, I'm pretty much used up. I mean, thank goodness I'm married to someone who's a great father, and you know, so it's not like the kids have no adult there to talk to or make dinner. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's tough. You are. Let's see. It's, I'm, I'm looking at your Facebook. Not Facebook. The uh, Amazon page, and uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's a number one book. Did you know it was number one? No. It says number one bestseller in the in the nursing books. Oh, you do, I'm, I'm the first to tell you. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, it says, it says it right here. You, you're getting a lot of good reviews for this, too. And you're a pretty lady, too. I, I know you just said you oh, were married, you. so just forgive me for that, but it's, it's the way I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is there anything in your uh, history? 
that you witnessed firsthand because you had injuries or something and you were treated? Um, no, it was actually when I had my, you mean that drew me to healthcare, when I had my yes. son, uh, we were living in Boston at that time, and I realized that, wow, nurses are really running the show here in the hospital. You are. Um, yes, you are. I know this. Yeah. Yeah. And I, di- I didn't know that, because um, I'd never been sick, I hadn't spent time in hospitals, and it really impressed me how important they were, and then obviously... That feeling really stayed with me. Do you think male nurses should have a different title? <laughs> 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 to, 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 I have the word nurse. Mr. RN. I have. I mean, I have great Mr. respect RN. for nurses, regardless of the, the gender. So don't hope I don't send the wrong message. But it just seems like a, the word nurse seems feminine. It seems like a, a female n- name. I mean, after all, well, we, nurse. <laughs> yeah, historic. <laughs> yeah, historically it has been. There are countries where the nurses are almost always men, although I can't name any of them right now, but I know historically, at least, that's been true. Yeah. Uh, Walt Whitman was a nurse. Um, our really? Poet. You know what we could do? Yeah. Just say, pronounce it like you're from Brooklyn. Just say, it's a noise. So if it's a guy, it's a noise. <laughs> and if it's a woman, it's a nurse. I think I figured out what to do there. I like that. <laughs> who's, who's, um, uh, what kind of feedback are you getting, and are you getting feedback from other nurses? Yes, other nurses are telling me, you nailed it, and that makes me really, really happy, because they're the people I want to be happy with the book. Uh, The messages I'm getting from the public are, wow, now I understand why some things in the hospital take so long. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. you know, we were we like were getting discharged. We were yeah. in a, a minor car accident, Robin and I, a couple of weeks, or maybe a month or so ago. We we hit a cow. I'll just tell you what we did. And we oh were, my gosh! We it were, was raining in we, at night, so we, we were not hurt. But you know, just to be sure, we went to the hospital, and and the lady who was there was at the end of her twelve-hour shift, and she was so pleasant and so kind. And I thought, mm-hmm. wow, after twelve hours. You know, she's just, I mean, I don't know how you do it, 12 hours. I mean, I, yeah. I'm here 12 hours, but I don't have to deal with a whole lot of people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they're different moods. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I think it speaks to, well, the training, but also the level of commitment to the job. I mean, nurses are so committed to the job. And physicians also, you know, people will really knock themselves out and and there's actually a a moment in the book where I just it's the middle of the afternoon I feel like all I want to do is lie my head down and then the patient who I thought was okay but isn't the call light goes on and I think oh she must be in more pain and just I say that's it you know I go to the door to see what's up with her and it's not that I'm superhuman it's that just that commitment to the patient that's what drives us that's what motivates us it's what gives us purpose and you know one of your characters in the book he thought might have been misdiagnosed how do you deal with a feeling like that oh you've you've seen something the doctor didn't see well no we all missed it this was the patient sheila who came in with a blood disorder and so i thought oh interesting patient and we'll tweak our meds well it turned out she actually had a quite serious surgical problem and it's not just me who missed it everyone missed it but I felt tremendously guilty like I should have seen this I should have known what was happening I should have paid more attention and but it really made me realize how much we we put patients in these categories she has a blood disorder and then that's the train track that they're on and so the whole idea that, well, her stomach's hurting a little bit, could that be something really, really serious that might kill her, doesn't really cross her mind because oh. she's not in, in that category. Mm. Um, and, uh, but that, that is what was happening. Uh, we need to take a little break, but we will be back. I want to uh, just reintroduce our guests so that you know who you're listening to. Teresa Brown is on the phone somewhere in Pennsylvania. I can't remember where you said you are. Uh, and um, She's in Wisconsin right now. Oh, Wisconsin. I'm sorry. Yeah, but she right. lives in I'm Philadelphia. Sorry. That's yeah. right. In the Pittsburgh. Bratwurst. In Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Yeah. Pittsburgh, sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, the book is called The Shift, One Nurse, 12 Hours, Four Patients' Lives. Uh, I've got nurses in my own family, both male and female, by the way. Yes, you do. Uh, and, uh, and, well, one's a noise. 
Not the other oh, that's right. <laughs> so we'll take a little break. We'll be right back with Teresa. This is WOCA. On this episode of What Not To Do, brought to you by Mike Scott Plumbing. If water runs through it, we do it. I thought I told you to call Mike Scott Plumbing to get this leak fixed. I did call the plumbers. They were just here. Let me get this straight. You're telling me Mike Scott Plumbing was just here? Uh, well, not exactly. Well, then who exactly was here? You know, the other plumbers. They were having a sale. Is that why there's duct tape on my toilet? Wait, I don't see any, uh, oh, that duct tape. Uh, well, at least it matches the grout color. There's a reason we only call Mike Scott Plumbing. They're on time every time. They don't charge extra for nights, weekends, or holidays. And most importantly, and I need you to pay attention on this part, they actually fix it. Okay, so you want me to try to fix it? Yes, yes I do. By calling Mike Scott Plumbing, like you should have done in the first place. Yes, dear. What's the number again? You really should know this by heart. 866-314-4443. Got it. 866-314-4443. On next week's episode of What Not To Do. Seriously? A helicopter? Hi, Matt Wilkerson here, your mobile Verizon rep. But not just here, I'll deliver the phone to you in your home. While I'm there, I'll only sell you what you need and I'll personalize it to you. Want to have me get you connected? Then call me at 352-528-0020. I even offer unlimited home phone service for just $20 per month. Just call me, your mobile Verizon rep, at 352-528-0020. Join us downtown for a truly wonderful Ocala tradition. The 32nd Annual Light Up Ocala on Saturday, November 21st from 4 to 9 p.m. The highlight of the evening will be the lighting of downtown Ocala and the 42-foot Christmas tree at 6.30. There'll be live entertainment, crafts, food, children's activities, and of course, a visit by Santa. And you can stop by the WOCA booth and register for your chance to win a brand new big screen LED TV. So come, be a part of the 32nd Annual Light Up Ocala. 23 minutes after 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Teresa Brown is on the phone. She is a nurse and a clinical nurse, a registered nurse. I don't even know what they all mean. All all the different types of nurses. It's a mystery to most of us. Uh, Her book is called The Shift, One Nurse, 12 Hours, Four Patients' Lives. Teresa, what do all the different things mean? What does clinical nurse mean, for example? And you work in oncology, so you work with a lot of cancer patients. Am I understanding it right? Exactly. Yes, exactly. So mostly leukemia and lymphoma patients, what we call blood cancer patients. Oh, my goodness. Often, often the really sickest patients, the hardest diseases to cure, uh, which is tough. But I, I got into oncology because my mother had a rare form of leukemia that is actually very, very treatable and was never really sick with it. And then a drug came out and that put her into remission. This was now 20 years ago now, um, and she's been great ever since, but that definitely created a sense of debt in my mind that I wanted to give back. Really? And that's what drew me to those patients. Can you smell cancer? That's a, dumb, that's a weird question, isn't it? But <laughs> some, somebody, somebody told me you can smell cancer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the dogs can. Dogs yeah. can. Oh, we mm-hmm. can't? Oh, you can't? I don't think so. Okay. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Now, when you're when you're uh, treating patients and you have to go between patients during your shift, how do you stay personal with each one and not get them confused? That is a good question. I mean, usually they're such individuals that it's really easy. You know, so in the book, I have. Sheila, who's in her 50s, and Mr. Hampton in his 70s, and Candace with really, really long hair, and that, you know, so they're all physically tend to be very different. Their personalities tend to be very different. Mm -hmm. It can be hard, say, if you've got, um, you know, like three middle-aged men to, (laughs) you know, (laughs) keep track of... uh, Oh, you would remember me. (laughs) Wait a minute, wait a minute. If I was one of those (laughs) middle-aged men... You, I'd be the guy who, oh yeah, this is the guy who didn't want the catheter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. That's probably all of us, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, you I would remember always, of course. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, When you're writing your pieces for the uh, uh, newspaper columns, how do you uh, combine the uh, personal with the uh, uh, medical to make it interesting to everyone? That's a great question. Um, 
Yeah, well, I think I always start with the story. So that's kind of the heart and soul of it. And then I think, well, what idea does this story illuminate? And how can I explain that idea? But I also work with a great editor, and sometimes he'll say, you really, you're lost in the story, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, the idea pieces have, don't all quite fit together, and so it's really good to have help because getting that balance exactly right can be tricky. In, in the book, um, there's a chapter called No Time for Lunch, and it starts off with you being dizzy, and, and this, mm -hmm. this is really an issue because if you're not keeping up with your nutritional needs, you, mm -hmm. you don't perform as well. That's what I'm getting out right. of it, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. ex explain that. Is that something everybody goes through? It is. It, at most places, lunch is not scheduled for nurses. There are hospitals that I bow down to where they actually have staff who come in and they cover the nurses so nurses can actually eat lunch um, like a human being in a, you know, a, a set amount of time that's sufficient. Yeah, it's very, very common that you rush through lunch, you don't, you start to shift at seven in the morning, you don't eat lunch until two. Wow. You're lucky, you know, if you have 15 minutes to eat lunch, that's a lot. A and I have worked at a system where we would cover for each other, which I, I don't find ideal, but it did mean that I did actually get 30 minutes to sit and eat my lunch, and it's incredibly restorative, physically and emotionally. Oh, sure. So it's just that's the case. Yeah. We, we have to have lunch more often. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> fact, I'm going to hang up and go eat lunch right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you got lives in your hand. We just have to make sure the radio show goes well. Yeah. Uh, uh, you seem to be a, a great mentor, though, because you have such a wonderful personality, and, and you take everything with uh, seriousness, but you also have to relate to the incoming nurses, the new ones, the aides. Thanks, yeah, and I make it my mantra to always treat everyone with kindness and respect. There's often in healthcare a system of, you know, attending doctor picks on resident and then the resident picks on the nurse or the nurse picks on the resident and then everybody picks on the aide and it just, you know, you see this trickle down of negativity and criticism and so I felt like being a good nurse should mean you don't participate in that and in fact one of our aides once told me, she said, I know that no matter what happens, Teresa will never yell at me. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. Yeah. Wow. It's so sweet, but also kind of sad, you know, it's a sad comment on uh, that we're not always great at relating yeah. to each other. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if the, if the nursing students uh, read the book, will they be more excited about what they've chosen to do or, or they say, oh, geez, I'm getting into something deep here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, my first book is actually, it's very honest, and a lot of schools of nursing now use it as a textbook. So uh, it seems to be speaking to them and I hope my intention was to get across this strong sense of purpose, that I love the work because I do love the work. You know, the system makes it hard to do the work as well as we'd like, but wow. it's a great job. Teresa, thank you for what you chose to do for a living, and, uh, and thank you for being on the air with us. I have a copy of the book, The Shift. Call me if you want the book. The rest of us have to go buy it. I found that on Amazon. It's a number one book in its category, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I'm the one who told Teresa. She didn't know. That's right. I feel, yeah, right. Time. I feel honored. Uh, mm -hmm. And then this Algonquin.com. I think that's the publisher, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Perfect. Teresa, thank mm -hmm. you. That was fun. Thank you so much for being on the air with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye-bye. We'll be right back. May very well have lost his own life in a drone strike. British Prime Minister David Cameron calling it a strike at the heart of ISIS. We have been working with the United States literally around the clock to track him down. Jihadi John, real name Mohammed Mwazi, was born in Kuwait but grew up here in London.